1995. I was 21 years old, halfway through college. It had been two weeks since my new boss, Steve, took over as manager of the United Artists Movie Theater at the Thousand Oaks Mall. I was one of five assistant managers who thoroughly enjoyed all the fringe benefits of having sway at a movie theater. These benefits included free movies at any United Artists, booze and weed-fueled private screenings of classics like 12 Monkeys, Apollo 13, The Usual Suspects, along with limitless access to paper movie passes I used as mall currency where I bartered for ice-blended mochas and cheeseburgers. <laughs> this was a 21-year-old's dream job. <laughs> that is, until Steve took over. Steve came in guns blazing, like in our face, full metal jacket, <laughs> Drill Sergeant Blaze, and he started barking out, things are going to change around here. This is how we do it now. Get used to it. And Steve, he was 29 years old, 6 feet tall, 275 pounds, balding head with two patches of fiery red hair, one on the back of his head and the other in this, on his chin in the form of a blazing goatee. <laughs> he was a scary dude. <laughs> He told us, no more after hours movies, no more movie pass bartering. Fuck. <laughs> so here's something about me. Steve's whole alpha male, chest beating, silverback gorilla routine, that was my kryptonite. I didn't grow up around this type of man. My dad, he was more passive. Uh, absent, a workaholic. <laughs> when he was around, he'd sit in his brown corduroy recliner, kind of off in the dark corner of the living room, watching TV, sipping scotch, quiet and brooding like a, like a sullen barfly in a soundproof chamber. As a kid, I'd try to connect with him by drawing him out, doing a kind of enthusiastic song and dance. Hey, Dad, did you see the Kings won last night? Charlie Simmer had a hat trick. They're in first place now. Without taking his eyes off the TV. No, I didn't. That's, that's great, Chris. <laughs> of course, it wasn't great at all. My dad wasn't seeing me. This was not how you raised a boy to be confident around the likes of Steve. I felt this insecure desire to be liked by Steve. So I overcompensated with this superficial charm, a kind of ramped up version of the song and dance routine I did with my dad. On my first night shift working with Steve, we found ourselves one-on-one -on -one in the theater office. Hey, Steve, did you hear? I heard you're a Lakers fan. Did you see Vlade last night? He crushed the jazz. Steve only half listened. And without looking up from his paperwork, he responded, no, I didn't, I was working, I didn't see it. Silence. More silence. All right, it's awkward silence now. And this awkward silence inflamed my insecurity. My response, ramp it up. <laughs> Next thing I know, I was doing a whole mystery science theater routine for Steve. <laughs> making up dialogue for all the customers. And this is what I did when I was desperate to connect. I put on a show. It was exhausting and not very effective. Steve gave some half-hearted laughs, but that was it. We had several of these types of forced exchanges. I, I felt like the harder I tried, the more on the outs I was. Fast forward to a day shift. A few of the other assistant managers, myself and Steve, were in the office. Also, Steve's boss was there, the big boss man. It was lunchtime, and Steve proceeded to inhale a burrito in like a minute. One of the assistant managers piped in. Steve, geez, the way you destroyed that burrito reminded me of Chris. <laughs> it was true. 
I had a reputation for being a voracious eater, <laughs> which I can see now was just another show. I got so much attention for my ability to eat, I took on this, ident this identity wearing it like a, like a badge of dishonor. I embraced this self-deprecation because at least I was being seen. Next thing you know, there's this raging debate going on. Big boss man insisting, no one can put it away like Steve. The other assistants came rushing to my defense, recalling the time that I ate 21 pieces of pizza at an all-you-can-eat buffet. I mean, they were, they were small pieces. <laughs> Steve and I, we talked with our eyes, basically said to each other, what's wrong with these morons? Then, out of nowhere, Big Boss Man blurted out, How about an eating contest? Before I knew it, people were making wagers on who would win, with the Big Boss Man saying he'd back Steve for 100 bucks. The other assistant manager said they'd back me. My reaction to all this was well, mixed. The needy part of me was basking in all this attention. The rational part of me was like, don't even think about it, deflect, avoid. Steve shifted into alpha bravado mode. Come on, Chris, what do you think? Looking back, I'm pretty sure Steve started pushing at me because he didn't want to let the big boss man down. Okay, so this was a sort of a moment of truth, let's call it. Am I gonna allow myself to be pitted against my new boss like some kind of cockfighter in a freaking eating contest? I mean, men are just so weird. <laughs> I felt pretty cornered at this point and I didn't really see a way out of it. And, well, and, uh, well, it would be quite a show, hmm? All right, let's do this! The big boss man and the assistants worked out the details of the eating contest. It was going to take place at Lucky Louie's Bar and Grill, a place notorious for serving the greasiest food. The time was set for 4 p.m., happy hour. In two days' time, we would eat until either one of us gave up or threw up. <laughs> Everyone arrived at Lucky Louie's, taken in the Dark wood walls, scattered sports memorabilia, and dusty fake plants in the various corners. This place smelled like bacon, and not in a good way. <laughs> As I tried not to trip on the snags and tears of the heavily faded and stained casino carpeting, Steve and I sat down at one of the heavily lacquered picnic tables directly across from one another, face to face. We shook hands. May the best beast win. Word got around. We had quite a crowd gathered around us. Steve looked at me with these wild open eyes. You ready? You're going down. I decided to play along. Well, we'll see about that. Round one, nachos. But not just any nachos. The menu description read, serves four. Next thing you know, each of us had this enormous wooden trough filled with chips and cheese dropped in front of us. Steve got a jump on me, digging right in. I followed closely behind, chomping. The nachos were dry and several burnt chips with lukewarm guacamole and pico de gallo. I stuffed my face and chewed and chewed and Steve kept pace and we both started complaining about the sad state of these nachos, demanding we move on to round two. The next round were a murderer's row of bad bar food. The plates were shoved in front of us one after the other. Round two, a dozen buffalo wings. Round three, mozzarella sticks. Round four, a giant plate of onion rings. It was during the next round, round five, bacon cheesy tater skins that my self-doubt began to creep in. Again, Steve aggressively started shoving these grease rockets in his mouth. I did my best to keep up, but Steve finished first. I was left with one last tater in front of me. My chewing slowed, and I took a deep breath, and I bit down into the fatty bacon, gooey cheese, greasy potato. I, I gagged, and 
And I gagged again, and I just I closed my eyes and chewed so very, very slowly. Just keep chewing. <laughs> Steve chimed in. How you doing, Chris? Ready to throw in the towel? I remained silent. I couldn't go out like this. I had to finish this tater skin, goddammit. It wasn't until now that I realized what a potential disaster this was for me. Not only would Steve see me as a joke, everyone else would too. If I stopped now, no one at the theater would ever let me live it down. So I pushed through, finished chewing the last of the tater skin, opened my mouth wide. <sighs> Next! All my fans around the table erupted. I could see a look of disappointment in Steve's face. His people egged him on with words of encouragement. The next round, round six, turned out to be the fateful final round against a most unexpected culinary adversary, a turkey and cheese sandwich. <laughs> Finally, something not drenched in oil, except as I took my first bite, I immediately gagged, realizing this was the turkey of people's nightmares. Not the well-seasoned day after Thanksgiving turkey. No, 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 no. This, this, this was the fully processed, artificial, overly salted, and wait for it, greasy, slippery, rubbery turkey that felt like biting into a cold slab of salty gelatin. And it wasn't, wasn't just me, wasn't just me. I look up at Steve as he was chewing and I see a chink in his armor. He was hunched over, <laughs> folded hands, eyes closed, chewing, and he was very, very quiet. <laughs> we both still had half the evil turkey sandwich left. He picked up his half and was about to take a bite, but he paused instead. He made some very serious eye contact with me. We had a moment. <laughs> I could tell he was struggling, and I think he could also see the turmoil on my face. He leaned in and said, dude, this is ridiculous. What do you think? Call it a draw? When Steve said those words, I felt this immense flood of relief. I was at my literal limit of for throwing up, and I think Steve was too. But I also think, just based on the sincere look in his face and in his eyes, he switched into manager mode looking out for one of his guys. And in that moment, whether or not Steve intended for this or not, I felt truly seen. No soundproof chamber, no smell of scotch, no song and dance. Just two dudes, eye to eye, seeing each other. Yeah, Steve, that's fair. Let's call it a draw. Everyone erupted in protest. <laughs> Demanded that we keep going until one of us threw chunks or there was a clear winner. Steve and I, we banded together against this ruckus mob, basically telling everyone, including the big boss man, too fucking bad, get over it. <laughs> Eventually, everyone accepted they'd just blown 100 bucks on bad bar food <laughs> for a draw. Later in the week, Steve and I are on the closing shift in the office. I'm counting money when he walks over and he drops eight of the newly forbidden movie passes on my desk. Hey, dude, thanks for accepting the draw. I pick up the passes. Steve, no human should have to eat a sandwich like that, huh? <laughs> Later on, as I'm leaving Steve's office, he calls out to me. Hey, Chris, I do think I could have beat you there. I look at him, he is smiling ear to ear. He's razzing me, he's busting my balls like a friend. I smile back at him. Well, Steve, that may be true, but I guess we'll never know. Chris Onderdonk, ladies and gentlemen, Chris Onderdonk. <laughs>